video recorded um, and be available at Northampton Open Media uh, at the end of the meeting. So let's go ahead and start um, with a public comment. Uh, anybody have a public comment? <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, I do. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Adele. Thanks. Uh, local Energy Advocates is a um, local grassroots organization that meets once a month and we have speakers. And uh, this coming Tuesday, the 17th at 7 p.m., uh, we are going to have a speaker named uh, Sarah Ross with an organization called Undaunted K through uh, 12 about funding um, school retrofits. So I thought that might be of interest to some of you and you are wel you welcome to contact me for the Zoom link. Thank you. When, when is that again, Adele? 7 p.m. on Tuesday evening. Ne like next Tuesday? But yes, this coming Tuesday, the 17th of January. Okay. Great, thank you. All right. Um, let's, why don't we go ahead into, um, we'll skip minutes for now on the national grid thing. So um, Gordon, you wanna go ahead and start your presentation? Uh -huh. Sure, thanks for moving that up uh, to, to make sure that we have Marissa here for this. And Adele, I think that issue about uh, funding school projects is kind of pertinent to what I'm going to be speaking about too. Uh, I'm again going to swipe off of this screen. Uh, so if you guys don't mind, I'm just gonna talk until I've, I've read, my, read through my, my presentation and then I'll get right back with you. I'm hoping to have a discussion afterwards. <clears throat> um, so I I'm, I'm just want to dive into what I see as uh, a problem that we're facing and then get to what I see as a good potential solution. Um, so the cost of making Northampton carbon neutral uh, will be very significant, but we have all agreed that it must be done. Just so the commission has a point of reference, the ground source heat pump project at Smith College is going to cost over $200 million. Uh, we should expect the cost for taking Northampton carbon neutral uh, to come in somewhere between 300 million and a billion dollars. Uh, the renovations required to reach carbon neutral will likely include, but not be limited to the following. The conversion of all HVAC systems from fossil fuel to electric, the purchase of new city vehicles and equipment, the installation of renewable power production, such as solar PV and wind turbines, comprehensive building energy renovations to include envelope improvements, lighting updates, water conservation measures, pump replacements, HVAC conversions, insulation, and other various measures renovations to the water treatment plant to replace pumps, aerators, and possibly build a methane capture system to produce power, the building of distributed energy production and storage throughout the city, renovations to the energy transportation network to allow for islanding of buildings, districts, and neighborhoods to assure resilience, and the conversion eventually of all of the buildings within the city limits to being electrically operated. So that's what we're talking about when we're, we're talking about becoming net zero ultimately. There, there are really only two ways that I'm aware of to do such an extraordinary volume of renovations. Uh, the first option is to keep doing things the way that we are. Um, we would simply replace things as they break and as we have the budget or grants to do so. Uh, this method is viable and it will get us to carbon neutral by 2050. Um, in fact, the very reason that our national goal is to reach carbon neutral by 2050 is that we can just do it as business as usual. 2050 is really uh, a wag of the dog. Uh, I am very proud that this commission voted to make our goal for the city of Northampton 
2030 instead of 2050. Uh, but it means that we must act and we must act now because in order to do a project of such complexity, uh, it will take at least two, if not three separate phases of construction. And each phase of construction is going to take two years. And it will take us two years of preparation before we can get to our first year of construction, uh, which means that it's going to be uh, it's going to be eight years at least of work for us to actually get all of the work done that we need to do. Uh, and, and so we actually have to start now uh, to, to do this work. Um, we don't have the internal capacity to develop and execute such a comprehensive project. Uh, for example, we currently have a team of engineers looking at six of our buildings comprehensively, uh, and that's going to cost over $100,000. And it's taken two years just to get to where we are now. And at, at that pace, it will take another three years to actually really start doing any construction on those six buildings uh, that, that we're looking at right now. And, and that doesn't even look at the dozens of other buildings that we have. And it's going to eat up all of our internal capacity to do big projects just working on that. And it means that there's, there's no way for us to actually meet our goal of neutrality by 2030 by, by doing these, these bits and pieces approach. Um, which is very concerning to me. So that's really, that is the problem that I see that we face. Um, the only way that we will meet the goal of carbon neutrality by 2030 is to comprehensively audit all of our facilities and all of our utility expenditures citywide. Uh, this information must then be turned into a comprehensive plan of project finance and execution with clear costs and paybacks. And this sort of audit exists, and it's called an investment grade audit. And an investment grade audit at the scope of the whole city will cost between two and five million dollars, uh, making it most likely entirely unaffordable using our existing operating funds. Uh, however, there's a way to pay for such an audit without any upfront expenditure. And that, it, that gets us to what I believe is our best solution. And the way that we pay for an investment grade audit without affecting our budget is to do it as a part of an energy savings performance contract or a utility energy savings project, okay? So it's an ESPC or a UESC. Both programs operate in the same way. They compare existing utility consuming equipment, such as boilers and air conditioners, to the best available technologies to determine the operational savings that would come from upgrading the equipment and access financing based upon the quantity of savings available. Uh, in the process of doing an ESP or UESC, the city would get the following things. It would get a preliminary assessment of project viability. So before anything is signed, before we owe anybody anything, we would get a preliminary audit by a team of engineers who would come in and walk all of our facilities and look at all of our utility costs from the past three years and spend at least a week or two pouring through all of that data and then tell us whether or not we even have a project that would pay for the audit, right? So the the most important thing in going into an ESPC project is that 
if we can get an audit paid for by the project and the audit's value is two to five million dollars and we can do a project that even just covers itself in the investment grade audit, that that audit would be of such extraordinary value to us that it would be worth it just for that, okay? Because the, the investment grade audit will give us a comprehensive roadmap to taking all of our facilities carbon neutral, and it would lay out what the paybacks of every single measure that we could take to get ourselves towards carbon neutrality, it would tell us how long it would take to get there, how much it would cost, and how fast it would pay for itself. And it would weed, it would help us weed out all of the different options that are available to us. And furthermore, I think that if we really push the boundaries of ESPC projects or UESC projects, we can get the energy service company uh, to give us an audit of the entire city. So including our residential and our commercial buildings and help us to build a roadmap for getting all of those facilities to carbon neutral as well. I think that we gave ourselves till 2050 for the whole city to become carbon neutral, but I think that we can push and, and make some real progress. And I think that we owe it to our residents to figure out how to do that for them as well. Um, once an audit is done, it would give us all of the access to financing all of the measures that we need to do. And it would also get us access to all of the utility incentives and the state and federal incentives. So an ESPC can be financed, not just with money borrowed against the savings, but an ESPC can incorporate all of the available utility incentives and all of the state and federal incentives as well. And it gives you so much leverage with the utility companies that you can bring the utility companies to the table and get them to partner with you as the city to help them to build out the infrastructure that they know that they need to do and they will pay for a lot to be done for us in that process um, and it gives us a team of experts who negotiate with utility companies all over the country to help us with that process of negotiating here um, and then once all of that is negotiated and a project is laid out it then gives us all of the project management and construction management folks all working on our team and all headed by one or two people where we can coordinate directly with them and get an enormous amount of work done. So the, the energy service company's staff it becomes a multiplying force for our own. So they can bring to bear four people for every one that we have and give us an enormous amount of ability to plan and to execute projects. And then the energy service company will guarantee some of the savings that are financing the project. So if there are shortfalls, the energy service company will compensate us for those shortfalls. But what I've found, it happens a lot more than that in these projects is that the energy service company doesn't ever want to owe you any money. So they will be conservative in their estimates on how much things are going to save you. And then you can use that excess savings that the project generates for further phases. So I was saying we need to do multiple phases of construction. So you do things at first that you know will pay for themselves. You wait two years so that they've started to actually show you what they pay for themselves. And then you re-leverage all of the excess savings into another phase. And by doing that, you're able to really accomplish a lot um, with, by, and also dramatically reduce the amount of money that you have to lay out for these projects out of pocket. And the last thing I'm going to say about this is that you can get a staff member paid for through the energy performance contract. And I've seen the Denver Housing Authority do this. 
And the Denver Housing Authority actually hired a full-time engineer to work in the office to monitor all of the savings that were being generated by the performance contract to monitor utility consumption across that housing authority. And then when they saw problems happening, they were able to go to the problems and fix them quickly without having it cost them a lot of money uh, in lost utilities. And that, that, that person was saving the Denver Housing Authority three to four times as much as it cost them a year in saved energy just to pay for that per, for that person. So it is really incredible uh, what can be achieved with these projects. I'm going to just pretty much cut it off there because I think I've taken enough time. Um, but again, I think that a performance contract is really Northampton's best option for achieving its goal of carbon neutrality by 2030. Uh, and our goal of doing this, I would recommend that we form a subcommittee of this commission to examine financing options for achieving carbon neutrality. I think that we really need to take a good look at this and figure out how we're really going to do these projects. And with that, I am back with you. Thank you. Thank you for all your time. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah. Um, I have a question for maybe Pat. Um, isn't is this um, similar to what we've done in some of the other buildings? I mean, I think City Hall we had window replacements done. I mean, this goes back eight years or I don't know how long ago the windows were replaced in many of the buildings. Um, I think. Um, uh, I don't know if it was e EOEA had the program or if it was the utility company had a program that basically funded the replacements um, based on the energy savings. Do you recall or do you know from the record, Pat, whether that's the case? Um, it was done by Con Edison in 2010. Okay. Um, I don't really know all the things that were done. But mm -hmm. it sounds similar to what Gordon's talking about. Yeah. Louis, I saw your hand raised. Yeah, I was going to bring up the Con Ed project, um, and, and I wondered how how we did with that. This, Pat, I mean, that was when I think David was um, still here, and I. But I wonder if we know how much um, what the uh, so I costs of that were. I thoroughly reviewed all of that paperwork when I first started with the commission. I read the investment grade audit. Um, and what happened was that there was some language in the contract that uh, someone within the previous administration didn't understand and they stopped paying for the measurement and verification services, which are supposed to go on every year. And somebody couldn't understand why they were paying for it and was uh, felt like it was an unnecessary cost and canceled the measurement and verification. Um, and so now we have no idea how it performed. And there was then a bunch of frustration about that. Uh, and that caused, I think there was a lot of people who had sore feelings about that past project. I think that it went badly. Uh, and when I read what was done, it really just scratched the surface of what is possible. Uh, I worked in the industry for a decade and I know how, I know how to extract really good audits out of the energy service companies and figure out how to get it paid for. Um, and what we really need now is information as to how to get to carbon neutral. And we need to, we need to really truly understand what's going on in our facilities. And I don't know how we could ever afford to pay the couple million dollars that it would cost for an audit that would really tell us that and give us all of the real payback information that we need in order to make decisions as to how to allocate our capital funds on these projects, because as we're doing it piecemeal, it's it's 
where there's always going to be fires to put out and those are going to end up being the priority because they're emergencies and and then we don't really ever see like what the proper order of, of doing things is in the way that we would with a truly comprehensive audit uh ben you had your hand up uh yeah so um i have been responsible for hundreds of investment grade audits so like i'm familiar with that process and one is fairly constrained when when you do this and you're constrained because the currency is not energy the currency is money and depending on the order in which you decide that measures are viable and how how you set things up the price of the energy is going to be determinative of what you can actually do and right now even even with increased uh, energy prices overall, unfortunately, they've increased for electricity as well. And because nobody knows what the future of energy prices is, the general approach has to, as again, as part of the stand, the ASHRAE standard is to kind of add an escalation factor to all the prices as though it were something predictable, you know, like it's not in touch with reality, the prices. But the result of that is very often the things we need to do which is to stop burning a fuel and start doing something else, have payback periods according to the investment grade audit method, right? According to this the level three audit method, they're gonna have payback periods in the 20, 25 year length time periods. And the answer will be don't do it, right? And just one, one other point, if you're trying to finance this from through an ESCO, their business is to make money, which means that they need something that's going to pay them in addition to the whatever slops they're going to allow the city to get, they need to get a profit in those energy savings. And if they anticipate that the energy savings will be negative, which in some cases, if natural gas is really cheap and electricity is considered to be escalating at a regular uh, rate, then they will simply not fund things that we may want the other thing is because the currency is energy use. Energy, we talk about as though it's expensive and it is, but what's really expensive is maintenance <laughs> and repair and, and those things. And very often, when so my other side is I work with cities and towns and very often I'll come up with an essentially an investment grade audit in which I'm recommending a path to zero carbon for them. And I'll say, Look, the, the energy payoff is not great, right? You're maybe you're breaking even, you know, that it's just difficult when when fossil fuels cost uh, too little. But here are the maintenance, here's the deferred maintenance that this wipes away. Here's the kind of maintenance budget that that these more sophisticated systems, say for instance, you're replacing steam, and all of a sudden you have all the maintenance headaches associated with steam just gone. That stuff I'll quantify because I'm not trying to make any money at it. But if you're an ESCO, unless you're able to get paid for that difference, you're not going to recommend it. I think that my experience with that situation would be that if if they don't think that the payback is going to work out over time, they wouldn't recommend that. Method. Exactly. They wouldn't. They're not. I don't think that they're getting paid. They get paid a flat rate off of the project, um, which is negotiated. The the continued savings uh, just has to be there to make sure that they don't owe anything to the client down the road when when energy prices fluctuate. But that that's a good discussion to have, and I would love it if you would join the subcommittee on how we should finance projects and get them done. Yeah, I guess my takeaway is you uh, you have to assume that they are out to make a buck, and that you have to have to police those contracts really yeah. really carefully. Absolutely, because I've encountered municipalities, many of them, who all have had ESCO contracts in the past, and they all get essentially the low hanging fruit stolen. <laughs> and then they have a lot of assumed savings and they have a lot of things that end up costing them money 
and not actually producing any real savings as measured at their energy meter. And I think that that is unquestionably the risk. And I think that the question would be, could we form an intelligent enough committee to review an ESCO contract uh, to, to deal with that? And, and I would pose that you and I together and a, probably a few other members of this commission could. Uh, it probably have to be somebody from the city <laughs> who understands finance. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. But the, the contracts, I, I have executed over a dozen contracts with the federal government. I understand how they're structured. I know how, how to review them. Um, and so I think that there, there are pitfalls for sure within these, but with good technical review and direction that we can steer it, um, and that, that is something that we could use to our advantage. Now, I don't know for sure that this is the best way to do things, but this is definitely a way. And I think that we owe it to the city to be discussing what and, and coming to a consensus as to what the best way to move forward with creating a real plan is. And, um, and this really is mine. I understand how this works. Um, and I understand how to leverage the, the ESCO into getting us at the very least a comprehensive audit and and Ben, I don't know if you would you would concur with my my wag of of the number on what it would cost to do an IGA for the city or if you if you think we need something different. But uh, I think you're probably right. And I and that's part of why I think that that pathway is just not feasible. It's too expensive to get too little. <laughs> you know, um, but you that's know. that's a problem. We don't know until we could have, we could go all the way through the preliminary audit stage without being liable for anything. So we could get a pretty decent look at, at the, oh, what yeah. UNESCO is proposing before we're liable for anything. And, and if we do that, we could negotiate at that point, the ESCO will really want it. And at that point we can negotiate with them as to what, um, what we want a project to look like. And here's, here's what I have to say about your concern about energy prices. I think that what, what we need to do is we need to go so big with a project that we, we take control of our future energy prices. So I think that by, in order to go carbon neutral, we don't need to get a bunch of, in, we don't need to get a whole bunch of individual buildings to carbon neutral. Every building doesn't have to be carbon neutral because what we should have is a bunch of our buildings that are carbon negative. Big, big facilities where we have a lot of space to produce energy. And we, we work out a contract with the utility company where we produce enough energy for the whole city at disparate locations and they give us credit across the city. Right. And we so just, that's, that's a separate discussion. And that, that, now we're yeah. into definitional problems. And, and so, so if we can control our own energy prices through owning our own production and storage and working with the utility company for distribution, then we take control of the, vi of the variability. Uh, and and that is where I think we have to go. I mean, how do we get to true carbon neutral? We can't rely on the grid. The, the grid is filthy. The grid is producing a ton of energy with natural gas, which leaks an enormous amount of methane and isn't even calculated properly. And it's got a mix of coal and then it's got hydropower, which is dams all along important waterways that do all kinds of ecological damage. So until we're actually producing our own power, we're not really, we're not even really being for real about our so being a part of the solution. That's definitely a def different conversation, but Louie, let me get to you as a committee member and then um, we can open it up to other um, non-committee members. Go ahead, Louie. I wonder, does Pat, do you have, uh, is the city, uh, accounting system have any method of uh, totaling what we what the city spends on energy? Um, I mean, I know that um, the uh, portion of the building department budget that we can see is the amount of fuel we spend on our vehicles, but 
I wonder um, if, and but that is, there's an account code and then a department code, but does that account code cross all uh, departments? And is there um, like H HVAC costs, electric bills, any of that kind of stuff that we could tote up so that we look at the, the total dollar amount of the hundred, you know, whatever, $12 million city budget we're actually spending on energy. So we know what kind of a, what, how big the pie is that we're starting to, to look at. Yes, I, I think there is. Um, that's the short answer. Um, how to do it. Um, I miss Chris. <laughs> Uh, basically, I know there's a, a website on Mass Insight there that the utilities feed all our information into, and I know that Chris tapped into it whenever needed. Um, so I think the short answer is yes. So, Louis, I think you definitely touched on something that was really important. I talked to Chris about this years ago. Um, he said that it was pretty hard to track across the city because every department had control of that part of its own budget. Um, I think that that brings up yet another important topic in this area, which is that when we do have somebody to replace Chris and we do have uh, a uh, uh, climate change uh, person uh, at a higher level, uh, if that happens, then I think that one of the things that they should tackle is pulling all of the utility costs into like a central clearinghouse so that we really have a good idea of that. And maybe taking central control over the utility costs instead of having that control lie within the departments in the budget process um so that we can then really figure out how to leverage that most effectively just want to add on to that and then i'll get to you susan um you know the uh, um the city did through chris commission that that evaluation and so to answer your question louis for some of the buildings it looks like that information um, for the city hall campus has been done recently so and then also we you know Chris hired um, or Central Services hired um, uh, another firm to look at the school buildings, right? So I think we have um, started collecting that information for the municipal buildings and the um, school building. So we've got some of those numbers. Um, Susan? Hi, so well, first of all, thank you, Gordon and Ben for that. That was really interesting. I've heard you refer to this at a lot of meetings. It was great to have that you had a chance to explain it. Um, um, and a couple things. First of all, do you have the notes and any links that you and also Ben have about this so we could follow up, learn a little bit more about it? That would be great. Yeah, um, I, I just essentially just read a, a, something I wrote up as a presentation and I sent it on to Carolyn. So Great. Maybe she could forward it on to you, and that would give you everything we spoke about in writing. And then, um, if you want to follow up with anything with me directly, please feel free anytime. Great, that would be great. I have a couple other things um, I want to address that you talked about. One is the piecemeal versus a whole systemic perspective and plan. I just wanted to say that that is just so important. I'm so glad you brought that up, and. Um, the other thing is this issue about microgrid. Microgrids having our own, generating our own energy here. And I think ultimately, well, if we're, even if we're talking about how we're gonna take care of each other in the community as our systems are increasingly falling apart, I think that that's a real question of energy and of reliability because the grid, if you just look at what's happening in California, you see, you can see the future of a lot of other places. California seems to be our example out front. So I think those are really important conversations that I've been hoping we could engage in. And I think the last thing I'll say is everything that you've talked about so far 
really points to the need for a climate crisis director and a department because um, this is a lot of work to monitor and even just pulling together what do we already know, what do we need to know and um, so I think you're just strengthening the case for what I hope is, um, you know, a rapid next step toward creating that position and maybe a, hopefully a department. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, ben. Ben. Yeah, just very briefly, I, if I can share my screen, I can answer uh, Pat and uh, Louis' question about costs and emissions because I logged into Mass Energy Insights. Um, and then you could see a graph of it anyway, if you're interested. Um, yeah. So uh, so I've sorted this. So this is just for FY22. Um, obviously, we can mess around with things until we're blue in the face. Um, but I've sorted it so the length of the bar is by cost. So already you can see electricity is a very, very large part of the cost, even though it's a much smaller part of our emissions. And gas is a big part of our emissions and a smaller part of our cost. And obviously, vehicles uh, with diesel are 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 high. Um, and you could, you know, obviously this is totalable, and we can download a uh, um, a spreadsheet with this information. Um, but you know, the 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 big megilla is the schools, and um, you know, so this is whatever that is eight eight hundred and twenty five thousand dollars in energy cost for the schools. Um, Chris, does that give you a grand total for our utility costs? Oh, this. Um, like the oh, total spend somewhere in here? It's probably in here. I haven't, uh, I, I didn't uh, find that in real use. Of, well, uh, you don't. You guys don't need to watch me futz around sure. with it. But the point is sure. that that information is there at least at this bulk level because all of our data is automatically sent to Mass Energy Insights, um, so we can get this and we can export it. I I do have ways of of exporting it out as as spreadsheets that we can mess with it. So the, I can give everyone like a quick rule of thumb on this. Uh, and and maybe somebody wants to follow up on on running the number, but the the escos basically will figure that you you take uh, thirty percent of your annual spend and you multiply it by twelve to get you your total available project size on about a twenty year term, and that flexes that multiplier flexes between twelve and fourteen depending on interest rates. So right about now we're probably at 12. So you can figure uh, an available sum of money uh, through a performance contract to be about 30% times 12, I would say. Hmm. So that that's your rough, your rough estimate. It looks like, you know, we're in the like $3 million range if I'm adding up all these bars in my head, mm -hmm. right? So you figure, a um, million times 12. So you're looking at 12, about a 12 to $14 million available project that could go into our, our schools and stuff. And that would, that would be work that we wouldn't have to use our capital funds for. And we would just finance it through a performance contract. And but then, adapt that rule of thumb to the fact that we don't care about electricity. I mean, we do care about electricity. We'd like to use less. But the challenge is taking that big cyan bar and turning it into an orange bar. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the well, challenge. Yeah. Our, well, okay. if we're if we're just looking at costs, yeah, there's yeah, it, it's it's obviously a bit more complex than just that. Yeah. But you know, our, we do we do find that as a rule of thumb, and regu you know, more and more regularly the cost of converting to an electric system is becoming the cheapest option. I mean, the, the price of mini splits is, you know, 10 years ago, we were doing oil to gas conversions or we were doing electric baseboard to natural gas conversions. Mm -hmm. And, and now if you see electric baseboard, you would never convert it to gas. You would convert sure. it over to a VRF system. And, and so, um, 
you know. Yeah. I so mean, I think, I think this know. might even, this is a good chart to even say, suggest where the biggest bang for the buck might be. You know, if we want to target the schools, the schools clearly are the biggest cyan, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, bad gas color, as well as the vehicles, right? So think, if that's but, where we want to start and we're completing the study of the schools is almost done. Mm -hmm. um, but that's certainly something that, um, you know, if you were going to take apart and try to target where we should focus our energy first, I, I, which I think is what Chris was insinuating um, previously, that's why we dropped the municipal geothermal focus was mm -hmm. because really the um, the biggest suck is are the schools. Yeah, there's our municipal so, buildings. Yeah. <laughs> I think, no. that, I think that it's I think that when you start thinking department by department, you end up making yourself a lot more work, you know, to do any one of these departments it, administratively is the same amount of work. So if you hired an ESCO to do it, each one of these different departments, it would cost them just as much time and effort to do every single one of them as it does to do all of them at one time. And so you actually have a lot of savings in project management by and engineering by just doing it once. Like you don't want to piecemeal it out. Breaking it apart is not the way to go. You want to do things based upon their cost effectiveness, not where they are within a department. And, and if we just try to attack the, the Goliath and, every single time instead of like you know trying to do the entire thing holistically but we really we need to to find a holistic approach to the whole city because it's going to be too much work to do it in individual pieces like we don't have till 2050 we're not supposed to do that like we we need we need to get going on the whole thing sure right anyway she can I talk to sharon What's that? Yeah. You want me to stop you? Thanks. Um, did I see another hand raised? Um, I don't um, see one now. I'm I'm on oh. the uh, road and I'm calling in. I'm sorry, uh, Eric Robin. Um, this is wonderful discussion. I just had a question uh, about would this kind of service contract uh, and uh, uh, also cover what I'm hearing a lot about uh, the district heating, or is that a completely separate project uh, that would be, you know, funded separately? Uh, the, so this is the, the, you know, the city center district heating um, that's getting a lot of attention. Thank you. Ben, do you wanna, I know that's your- I mean, I there are lots of ways to fund that uh, a district heating system. The benefit of district heating system is the efficiency and the ability to charge for heat. It helps if you've got an inexpensive way to produce it. Um, and the challenge is it's huge, huge upfront investment. So you need to have some company that's capable of investing like a utility on a 30 years or, or more scale. Um, as a city, we can't do that. If the city wanted to create a municipal utility, it could. If there there are companies out there that will basically do this as a service and they get licensed by the city for whatever number of years, um, probably, although some in some ways it's structurally similar to an ESCO, but it's usually not the same companies. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, so any any solution can be examined in the investment grade audit. So uh, an energy performance contract or a utility energy savings contract is not um, is not supposed to be technologically biased. It is it is supposed to be evaluating all of the best options. Okay, we have a couple more minutes so we can spend on this. Um, I saw, I think, um, Councillor Maori, and then um, we can probably take one other comment. Okay, yeah, I really appreciate this, Gordon. You know, we've, we've talked about performance contracts, but I feel like I had some missing uh, pieces of the 
of my knowledge there. So that was a great, uh, great overview. I'm just trying to picture, you know, I, I guess it's really a kind of a question for the department heads and the director, you know, how does this, so now I, in case uh, no one, you know, someone doesn't know, we've just, um, mayor has just instituted a climate change um, mitigation stabilization fund, which is very exciting. Uh, and and seeded it with $3 million of ARPA money. And, and part of the uh, the reason for establishing this, uh, besides kind of weathering different um, administrations, it's kind of permanently set up there, is that it, it's, will, it's more transparent and will make it easier to, um, to apply and receive grants. So I guess I'm just trying to picture, I guess at some point I'd like to understand how to integrate this into our existing finance financial system in the city. And I, you know, I'd like to talk to the finance director about this, you know, at some point, um, you know, so I, I'm assuming I, I how to, I guess a more sp a specific question is how do grants interact with this? Can they be integrated or are they just completely separate? Because that's been our goal right now. That's what we're set up. We're setting up to do. Thank yes. you. Yes. Yes. That's a great question. So any kind of uh, incentive or grant money can be put into a performance contract so that all of the management of that construction can happen through the existing staff within that contract. And so it really does create a, a really good avenue for getting large grant funded projects done quickly with like a really significant team of professionals already on it. And so there, are, I think there are cost savings to be had there because you don't have to mobilize a different group to to manage and construct uh, something funded with the grant, you can do it through the performance contract and the existing already hired contractors. Um, so it you can shuttle money into these uh, from uh, utility incentives, and there really is, I think, right now a massive opportunity to really negotiate with the utility companies on how they're going to transition their businesses. They know that the old top-down way of producing energy is going by the wayside. They've known it for a decade and they're trying to figure out what the solution is. And we can present ourselves as a partner in this and find a way to get them to build their critical infrastructure on our property, giving us access to it and some control over it. And that would be tre a tremendous win for the city. A tremendous win to have a lot of the utility infrastructure on our property, and it would take it would get take us an enormous way towards resilience as well. Um, and so we can we can move utility money, grant money, state money, uh, any any kind of funds that we can find into these projects, and it, it gives us a lot of speed and efficiency because we don't have to constantly be be getting a group together to manage another project. We just take care of a lot of projects at once. And then we see what we've got left at the end and we finance it however we need to. But at least we would leverage as much as we can. You know, it's, it doesn't get everything done, but it will get a lot done and it will give us a plan as to how to get the rest done that we can follow. And in the, in the time frame that we have, we, we could put an RFP out for a performance contract in say a year, right? If we took a year talking about it and figuring it out, we could put out an RFP that requests that the ESCOs put a proposal together for taking the city completely carbon neutral and how they would do it. And we get them to put their brains on it. And then we pay for that work of theirs through a small performance contract that that takes care of what it can take care of. And then on the other end of it, we have that work taken care of and we have a roadmap in hand and we don't have that roadmap right now. And I don't see how we could get to that roadmap in less than two years without an energy service company uh, because we can't afford to do it ourselves. And, and so we we need help. And, and, and so I'm, I'm like, completely open to other options. I'm here for it. I, I'm actually asking if we can please so form a subcommittee to talk about it. 
but we need to come up with a way to come up with this plan. And um, can, can I make a suggestion that maybe, um, so after your presentation, let people mull it over, read what you sent earlier, and then we can put it on the agenda for next time, whether what we think yeah. um, a next step might be if there is a next step. Does that sound good? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, um, Jay, I think you had your hand raised. I don't know if you still have a question or a comment. And then we need to move on to the next items on the agenda. Yes, thanks. I'll be really quick. I just want, um, I'm, uh, I'm very excited about what you're doing. This is my first opportunity to participate. The sense of urgency is great. Um, the comments about how can along the way the commission facilitate the broader community to be a part of this goal. And one of the best ways to have the community do that is to invest their own money in the incentives that they alone can capture in building the city's infrastructure by building solar arrays and other energy sources locally, it seems to me. So um, I, I had a question, you don't have to answer it now, but just a question about, will there not be some planning or audit monies in the um, in the IRA climate monies when they come out available to communities? Or do we really have to do all of this independently? Um, and, and it seems to me that but the, the directions that you're talking about right now are fantastic, but you would, I think, want the, the entire commission to really understand exactly what the drivers are for the utilities in this in these two options and um, and really understand that the, at a detailed level, follow the money and see how it works. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think that's that's what I really wanted to say. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for your comments. I, um, I think that any any money that we could put into a project would be fantastic. I think that, uh, as you say, you, you simply follow the money in these projects. A performance contract is a financial instrument. That's really all it is. It's a financial instrument that gets work done and it gets experts in on the ground. And um, you only do what pays for itself and you can put as much other money into it as you want to, to use it as a multiplier of your investments. Um, and I think that the city has at its disposal enough people who understand how these work to really thoroughly review what we're doing. Um, th that might require a budget. So thank you. Thank you all so much for the amount of time that you just took for this. I really appreciate the discussion. I really do. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Um, okay, so let me just find, um, sorry, here. Um, let's go back to, can leave minutes to last. Um, I, the next item I had on the agenda, sorry, I just pulled it, uh, I just got rid of my agenda. Um, here we go. Um, was about this, um, I don't know if you are following this or you got um, notice, there was an email notice that came out um, regarding National Grid's EV program. Um, so they're going through the process of um, um, getting approved by the utility company for each B charging infrastructure. Um, there's no action at the moment, but um, They've um, they filed for a program with the um, Department of uh, Public Utilities, and um, the program is to create um, to start sort of filling in the gaps of um, EV charging stations and other infrastructure. So they're they're claiming it's going to be up to thirty two thousand additional charging ports um, for vehicles throughout the Northeast. So I don't know um, how much of that is actually targeted in Massachusetts, um, but it includes incentives for uh, electrical upgrades for residential property owners, um, uh, public infrastructure, and fleet infrastructure. Um, so I guess the question is, I mean, right now, I think it's just sort of wait and see where this is going, but, um, 
I think this committee was involved in looking at opportunities to um, fill out Northampton's infrastructure. Um, and so I just want to put it out there as something that maybe um, the committee or some subset of the committee might want to follow and see how we could participate in, um, in this program that National Grid is, um, you know, spearheading, I guess, probably the best way to put it. Um, so it's really more of a, a one, I guess, um, what's the interest level and two, you know, I, I would think that you guys might want to keep apprised about sort of how this progresses and when it, when it can start to roll out and how we might be able to participate to support that infrastructure coming to the city. So that's all I have. Okay. Um, all right, so um, Pat, you wanna talk about green communities? Sure, um, let's see. Um, yeah, we, uh, more than a, a report, more of a, an announcement. Uh, one of the last things that um, Chris Mason did was to submit a proposal to the Green Communities Competitive Grant Application. And we've just uh, received an award letter from Green Communities uh, for $60,284. Uh, and this money is earmarked for four locations, uh, the Forbes Library, Attic Ceiling and Insulation, the Leeds Elementary School Crawl Space Insulation, the Academy of Music Air, uh, Attic Air Ceiling and Insulation, and the James House Learning Center, uh, also Attic Air Ceiling and Insulation. So the, uh, the building receiving the most would be the Forbes Library at $38,015. Leeds would get uh, $14,341. The Academy of Music would get $2,114 and the James House would get 5,814 for the total again of 60,284. Uh, good job, Chris. Um, so today I actually received uh, the contracts and um, we're gonna start working on them and uh, to get them signed. Uh, the work cannot start until everything's signed and we get a notice to proceed from the DOER, uh, and I think the monies need to be uh, spent by 2024. I'm not quite sure of the month. That's about it. Yay, Chris. Yay, Chris. <laughs> and Chris will help me. I actually have a phone call with Chris tomorrow to talk about where all the files are, <laughs> that type of thing. That's good. He hasn't run totally away. <laughs> exactly. Please speak appreciatively. I'm sure you will of everything we did. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Um, I didn't have anybody clamoring under the council report line item, and I guess Councilor Mayor, you're the only one standing. Still, uh, Marissa had to leave for um, the capital improvements. Um, meeting. So I don't know if you have anything, no pressure. I just want to make sure that we didn't forget you if you uh, yeah. did have anything. Well, it was uh, the only thing I was going to mention was the climate um, change mitigation stabilization fund, which like every time I say it, I think, yeah, we think of another name. <laughs> but anyway, um, it's I, I hope I don't know if you all knew about it, but it's, I think it's quite exciting uh, development. Council just passed that. So yeah, that's the only thing uh, brewing. I'm, I'm still um, thinking about the stretch code ordinance. Um, and I was just talking to Rep. Sabadosa today to understand that better, the process with the state. But that's all I got brewing. Thanks. OK, great. Um, any other um, updates from any of the other members? Okay. Um, all right. So I guess the last thing we have is review and approval of the minutes. 
that's that's the only thing we need to vote on tonight. <laughs> Move to approve the, the minutes. Um, Second. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. This is um, a teleconference meeting, so we have to do a roll call on that um, motion and second. So Ben? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Pat? Yes. Rachel? Yes. Um, Louis? Yes. And I guess that leaves me. Yes. Okay, that's unanimous. 